How was it? Amazing? Okay. Whew, um, this is really special and I feel so honoured to be able to welcome to the stage the one and only Jodie Foster. Happy to see you. I think she liked the movie. <laughs> like the movie. It's getting five star reviews, don't you know? Oh, I bet a lot. How many people saw it in an actual movie theater when it came out? Oh, that's quite a few. I'm surprised. That's great. Wow. Well, that's nice. Um, quid pro quo, yes or no, Jodie Foster? <laughs> is that okay way to start? A good way to start. Um, this is, must be. I mean, what is the the the, the emotion or the feeling to? come here to a room this warm of people 26 years after this film was originally released and get that reception? Well, you know, the, the, this kind of experience to have a movie that um, came from such a wonderful book and inspired so many people to do the best work that they'll probably ever do in their whole lives and then knowing that the film in some ways is timeless and lives on, it's sort of the little pot at the end of the rainbow that you always hope for but that you never get and then... It's, it's, it's actually quite difficult because you get it. I got it. I was, you know, what I, were, I was 29 years old or something, and I didn't realize it was kind of going to never happen again. You know, you sort of you don't realize how rare it is. Uh, but it is rare, and I feel very blessed. So. The, um, what, what, what's the film about to you? What do you think the film's about? Because <sighs> it's interesting hearing people tonight who've seen it again and go, actually, I hadn't realized that it's about this or that but for you well it's about a lot of things I can tell you the reason that I um, lobbied for it because I did try hard to get this movie um, I was not the first choice um, was because I had in my whole life had been playing a lot of victims so I'd been playing a lot of women that had been acted upon and things had been done to them and um, that is a big part of women's history um, it would be remiss to, to only play characters that are presidents or, you know, doctors. I mean, we, a large part of our history has been about being acted upon. And for me, the reason that it was so important to make this movie was that there was a sort of healing process and almost like a growing up process to finally playing the woman who saves the women. And um, that woman who is saving the woman sees a reflection of herself in the women that she's trying to save. And um, uh, when you think about the mythology that a movie like this comes from, so a very classic mythology of you know a prince, um, his country is suffering from an illness, he is sent off into the woods and he meets gnomes and demons along the way, and he goes into this forest of experience. He's given the panacea to you know bring back finally, he endures all these terrible things to bring back finally to. Uh, his people, having learned all these terrible things about himself, this self-reflection, and realizes that once he's cured his people, that he will never be of his people again. And that is an age-old classic myth. But it's never been reserved for women. So for me, that was the most exciting thing, was to say, you know, we're going to take a classic human myth and ask ourselves, why in the hell has this been only reserved for men? And do, is, is there no such thing as female agency? And is there a way to have a female character that can participate in this mythology? You said you fought for this role. I did. What did you do to convince Jonathan? <laughs> it, wasn't a, it wasn't a big fight. I mean, I... How did you convince him? I, I knew that another actress was... He, that he was going to hire another actress. Well, first of all, I read the book and then tracked down the book to buy the book and uh, to try to produce the movie. And I found that it was, had already been bought by Orion and that they had already gotten a writer on. And so I called, I knew everybody at Orion. And I said, I just would like to tell you that I would really like to make this movie. I just won an Oscar. I thought, okay, <laughs> no, I might have a shot at this. And, um, your skills. <laughs> and then the director was Gene Hackman. Uh, actor, who you guys know, he was going to play, he was not going to play Lecter, I think he was going to play Crawford, and but he was going to direct the movie, it was going to be his first film as a director. And he read, the first draft came out, 
and he read it, and he said, this is too violent, I can't possibly make this movie. He dropped out of the film, and I found this out, and I said, okay, well, he dropped out of the movie, but, I, but I'm going to be considered for the next director. <laughs> and the studio said, well, no, the next director is going to be Jonathan Demme, and he's not interested in you. So I was just devastated. I knew that, you know. So I got on a plane he, after he, he, you know, had offered the movie to somebody else. I got on the plane. I met with him in New York, and I said, I would just like to be your second choice. And these are the reasons why. And I kind of laid out all these reasons why. And then I left and, you know, didn't think anything about it. And uh, then eventually got a call. Amazing. That's brilliant. Is it, is it right that Sean Connery at one point was going to play Lecter? <laughs> I don't remember Sean Connery. No, but it sounds good for your people, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> No, no, I... Uh, it's terrible, but I... But I there were, there were a few other American actors that I think the studio w were keen on um, of the variety that you might think, you know, whether it was Al Pacino, Dustin Hoffman, Rob De Niro, that kind of thing. Um, and I think both Jonathan and I were very keen on the idea of having a British actor play it, uh, uh, and specifically Anthony Hopkins, because, you know, Lecter is a manipulator. Uh, Lecter has has this way of using language in order to seduce and entice and to keep people at bay. Mm -hmm. And we felt that the American style of kind of Stanislavski acting was really the wrong route. I think you needed, uh, instead of it being, you know, why is this serial killer a serial killer, uh, you know, you're not looking for emotional reasons. I think you wanted to see the monster. I think you really wanted to see that almost Shakespearean monster. So that's why we jumped the pond. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the relationship and the chemistry between you and Sir Anthony on the screen is, is unbelievable. It's just incredible. But you never talked during the making of this. And it was a dumb thing. It was really dumb. It worked. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't on purpose. We had done a rehearsal in New York City. I'd gotten there early, and I sat down. I got my stuff all ready. I got in there early. And so then keen. nobody else was there. So I went away and took a phone call. And by the time I got back, everybody was sitting down. So I never had a chance to say hello to him. I just sort of waved hello to him. And we did this rehearsal. We, did the, we read the whole script. And he was petrifying. He was absolutely, he was so scary that... I couldn't bring myself to talk to him after the rehearsal, so I left. <laughs> then he went off and did another movie, and I did the whole first part of Silence of the Lambs without him. Um, he, he, you know, he only shot for like seven days or something, or ten days of shooting, or maybe even less. Wow. So I never saw him until halfway through the shoot, and finally he came in, and I didn't get a chance to work with him. They screwed him into that door. So he was locked in there. He was locked in there. It took like 15 minutes to get him out. Um, there was a whole process with the Makita drill and everything in order to get him out. So they put him behind the glass, and I was like, hi, hi. And then, because the scenes were so long, the scenes were like 10 pages long, they're quite long, we would do his side one day, and then his stuff was done, they'd unscrew him, and then they'd do my stuff the next day. And much, much of the dialogue is to camera. If you notice, there's a lot of stuff that's direct to camera, a sort of a Hitchcock technique. So some days, I never even saw him, and he never even saw me. I would hear a voice behind the camera, and he would hear a voice behind the camera, but we couldn't see each other. So we would look directly in the lens for a lot of, the, a lot of our performances without being able to see the other one. I mean, by the time I got to his 10 days, I realized I'd never spoken to the guy, really. And we finally finished. I was eating a tuna fish sandwich. It was the last day of shooting, and I said, you know, I, I, I was a little scared of you. And he said, I was scared of you. <laughs> and then we had a big hug, and that was the end of that. That, that, I think, though, is, is part of why it's so incredible, that performance, and that, that just the way that you, you completely get him as well. That's what's so amazing about Hart as a character. I guess so. I mean, I, he, I think Anthony really is one of the humblest people that I've ever met, uh, but I do agree with him on this one point that he always makes, which is it really was a beautiful script, and... Um, it did not take much. In fact, this draft of the screenplay was almost virtually to the word the original first draft. Uh, I don't know if you know a lot about making movies in Hollywood, but very often you bring other writers on. There's many, 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 many drafts. This can go on for years and years and years. This one came out of the typewriter and went directly on screen. And that's a testament, I think, to Thomas Harris's novel and what a good novel that was, that everybody was so inspired by that novel. What do you think you connected with with Clarice and why you were so, I don't know, driven to, to be part of this and bring her to life? 
Um, I, I, you know, the, the, the reasons that I told you, but I also think that there was something about somebody who had been traumatized by sound in a way, this idea of having been traumatized by, uh, by, by being small and by, by not being big enough to, to, to help or to care for somebody who, and, and having been such a failure. Um, that, that trauma from that is what she brings to her character. And the, the performance that I had done before that from the, in The Accused was somebody who's really quite brash and vulgar and, you know, talks loud. And um, I, there was something I really wanted to explore about the delicacy of somebody um, uh, who doesn't, you know, who knows that they will never be big enough. Mm -hmm. And they will never be big enough to accomplish the task that's ahead of them. So they have to engage some their their most extraordinary talent, which is their heart. You know, I I heard you talk brilliantly about how much you love the camera. Oh, and yeah. someone asked you about theatre, and you were like, mm. "Nah, I'm not that keen." <laughs> um, and you were like, "I love I love working with the camera, and I love w what you can do with it." And you know, in terms of with this particular film, you talk about how much you have to play to the camera as opposed to. With, with the other actors and stuff. Is it, a, is it a big difference for you? Is it, do you, you know, in terms of how do you, you, you obviously get a lot out of, yeah. of, of that kind of performance? Well, uh, I started working when I was three years old and I started doing features when I was six and the camera's always been a big part of my life. And <laughs> the, I think the part that really seduced me as an actor uh, was how it was made. Uh, as a young person, I was really... I didn't really understand what acting was. I didn't have a lot of respect for it. I thought it was just saying lines that someone else wrote. And but I understood things like you focus and how to load a magazine and you know I, I loved all of the the technical stuff that goes into making something that eventually becomes seamless. Um, so that was the part that really got me interested. And um, I think that I knew that I wanted to be a director from the time that I was young. And so that was the part that really that really got me. Um, so I love telling stories by using all of the different, it's not just the acting, but all of the different uh, vocabularies that are at your fingertips, whether it be sound or props or uh, production design, music. Um, those things coming together to me is really beautiful. And we were talking out there when we knew people were watching the end of the film, and you were talking about the last <sighs> sort of section of the film, which was the, the only part, the last day of shooting, which was... <sighs> It was a hard. You're still last bitter day of about. I'm a little tired. I'm still tired. It was it was a 20 22 hour shoot, and it was a very long shoot. It was a good five and a half month shoot, in the winter, um, one of the coldest winters that we'd ever had in Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh, if you know, is really it was like it's cold in Pittsburgh. Um, even the stage where we were shooting in wasn't a real stage. It was a Westinghouse factory that used to house 35,000 people. So it was impossible to keep it warm. Um, it really, it just was, it was a very difficult shoot. And um, at 22 hours, people start making mistakes. And um, it, it, it was supposed to be a regular 12-hour day. In fact, the band for the rap party was sitting there the whole time waiting. <laughs> and they, they went to sleep. There was a trailer. They all went to sleep in a trailer. Um, we, when we did wrap, it was 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, even though we were supposed to wrap the day before. So it, it was really, it was, it was tough. And every time that I'd come through one of those doors, the last shot is me coming through the doors with the gun, kind of bursting through the doors. And then I look around, and then there's another door. And I burst through that door, and then there's another door. And it's all in one continuous shot. But, you know, everybody was so tired, they just kept forgetting to close the doors. So I'd come, <laughs> I'd come through the first door, and I'd be like, oh, the door's open again. And I'd have to go back out again. It's awful. <laughs> and they were all off to do? They were off to go to Bimini, which is in the Bahamas, which is a fabulous location I wasn't invited to. <laughs> um, there is, of course, they only had one sunset shot to do in Bimini, but they had to bring the entire crew and you but know, not you. And load not me. And load all the cargo bins with cameras and lights and all this kind of stuff. And uh, many of the crew members, uh, crew members, lots of the crew members come off of that. You know, Jonathan Demi himself comes down the staircase and puts his arm around a lady and walks, and walks down the path. Um, and that's it. Just one shot. So everybody's dying to get on the plane to Bimini, and that was why we had to do the 22-hour day, because they didn't want to miss the, you know, the miss their shot at the plane or something. 
You mentioned I'm Jonathan being in that shot. That was quite a regular thing where oh, yeah. it would be... Everyone, everyone in the crew it, was always in every shot. And um, sometimes Ted, Ted plays an FBI agent, does he not, at one point? It's, Ted Demi? Yeah. He might. Chris Isaac is in there. Oh, yeah, Ted Demi is here. Yeah, he did come. That's right. Ted Demi's in there. Chris Isaac came one day um, to play one of the SWAT guys. Did you see him? Right? You saw him? Um, yeah, it was funny because he had to have his hat like <laughs> just a little bit like that. I was like, can you imagine? Like one little curl is... Um, yeah, different people, you know, uh, his kids, the nanny, the friends, somebody he met at the gas station. It was your every, publicist. Yeah, every, every day it would be somebody. I, I'd be, I'd be walk, I'd be in a scene doing something, and my assistant would be behind me, like, "What are you doing here?" She's like, "They made me. I can't." Do you think all the way along, since you know, maybe not from the age of three, but along the way, you've been kind of just collecting? things to that point where you decided to direct and decided to make and tell those stories from a different way? It's a great film school, uh, being able to be on movie sets. And, um, and it's a real, it's a, it's a gift to be able to be in the position where you understand why a scene works and why it doesn't. A lot of people understand why, you know, they can read books about editing or they can work on movie sets and know how the lights work. But it's very difficult to understand in a moment why a scene works and why it doesn't. It's, it's just an intangible skill. And the, there, there are very few people that get to see that close up. Actors do. And sometimes, you know, the camera operator does. Um, so it's a, it's a good jumping off, uh, jumping off thing to get to directing as long as you're paying attention. Uh, a, lot, a lot of actors aren't interested. I think a lot of actors aren't interested in becoming directors. But I was from a young age. Is it a different feeling from being on set first day as an actor, as a director? Uh, you mean the first day? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my, my, uh, it is. Um, well, there's, they're, they're incomparable tasks. I mean, that being a director means that you are responsible for every single thing that the movie is. So you're responsible for every color, every sound, every decision. There isn't any decision that isn't yours. Uh, from the beginning, meaning, you know, whether... Once, once you get, once the the film is launched, or so from casting all the way till the final prints, um, so it's a pretty stressful, stressful job, and um, you have it's you have to have an opinion about everything. Basically, what are your favorite processes within all that? As you say, you're the boss of everything, yeah. but what are the favorite parts of it that you you relish the most? Uh, gosh, I mean. You know, so every part, part of, of it is so important. Every part is part of the storytelling, and there isn't really any detail that I am not involved in. Uh, the one part that I think is always the most satisfying is when you finally put on the score. Um, there's something about the way music finally sews up everything and makes everything seamless. Mm -hmm. So it always feels like it's in pieces until you get the music onto the movie, and then suddenly it becomes its own it's its own organism and um, it allows you it allows an audience member to be in the audience and not realize where they are what point do you bring on the composer when you're making a film um, you know I've learned a lot of lessons about that the, um, on the first the first movie I made or the first movie I directed I didn't have a composer until late and I wasn't really sure what I wanted and then I realized I wanted jazz and it was a jazz score and that was great um, so I like this idea of bringing someone on late, um, but I, cut, I got pressure on, a, on two of my movies. I got pressure to bring a composer on early, and what ended up happening is I had to fire them, which is awful. Um, not because of any fault of theirs, but because you do not know who, what your film is until your film is finished. You just can't possibly know. Um, the process of learning your movie, your movie changes just like an organism does. It changes over time. It walks and talks a different way. Um, and you don't 100% understand what kind of music is right. So now I've learned that I wait. I wait, I wait quite a while to bring a composer on. Um, I think some people in the audience might have seen um, Mindhunter, which is, oh, I can't um, wait to see is that. awesome. Um, but from seeing Silence of the Lambs again, you go, hmm, <laughs> I wonder where the idea for that came I, from. But those characters are the real characters, are the real characters of John Douglas, who was the profile that Crawford is, is uh, based on. Um, all of those characters are the real characters of Mind Hunter. You got some questions? Oh, sure. If you wouldn't mind answering real Can't questions wait. from real people. Okay. Um, this is from. Uh, I wish people would put their actual name instead of like silly Twitter accounts. Ninety Bro. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did you find it to be a natural progression from acting to directing? I do think it's a natural progression. Um, I, I. Th 
when I was six, I mean, I'd been, I'd, I'd worked as an actor. When I was six, I did a television show, and one day I came on the television show, and the guy who had been playing the dad was now also the director. And I was just flabbergasted. I couldn't believe that they would let an actor be a director. And I, well, I just kept watching him all day. It just was, I was so in awe. And I said, someday that's what I want to do. And I feel like I knew that from an early age. I didn't think that was possible. I never saw another woman director. And I didn't know that, they would ever, that there would ever be an opportunity for a woman director. So um, what I was told was, you have to write in order to direct. And so I... That's really was my focus was on writing, um, and I wrote all during college, and and you know, was th with the idea that uh, eventually I would direct direct those movies, and and then I didn't have to write because I got uh, I was able to get scripts from. Is that is that the kind of the dream for it to be the full package in terms of, you know, in terms of you you talking about being the boss of it all, and you you know you're in charge of every part, and then well not the writing I found that for me anyway I find I'm not. At, a good enough writer for myself. I don't, I don't approve of my writing. <laughs> so I like better writers than me. And um, hard on yourself. I really love the. Pr I love working with a writer. I really like that process, that back and forth process, and um, the way my mind helps their mind. So I, I like my more editorial, more critical, more intellectual mind, and how that kind of combines with a writer's more creative side. Okay, this one's from Zed. Could be a real name. Um, <laughs> do you have a criteria for scripts that you read? Oh, um, well, I, I am really picky, and um, it doesn't mean you know, the scripts that I say no to or that I don't take on. It's not because they're not good, and very often they, they're wonderful and, and mind blowing, and they go on and they're phenomenally successful. Um, I have to be moved personally, and I have to have some kind of personal connection. That doesn't mean that I can't make a sci science fiction film about Martians, but there has to be some psychological question that I'm working out. Um, and that's as true with acting as it is directing, although quite different. Um, so that's a really small needle in the haystack. Um, and I, I wish, I, I sometimes feel very bad that I don't work more. Uh, I just, it has to be meaningful to me, and otherwise I would rather do other things. I would rather travel and learn ski. things. And ski, yes. <laughs> I love that. I, I listened to a great podcast that you were on. Oh, yeah? Where you, I can't remember what it was that you compared to skiing, where you were like, you know, the great thing about skiing is if you don't pay attention, you're just going to die. That's right. <laughs> and, it's just kinda... and that's why it's so relaxing. <laughs> that's what, yeah. Because you can't think about taxes or Trump or you know any, anything. You can't because you will die and hit a tree. So there's there's a there's a real uh, relaxation for me with focus. Um, uh, and that's always been my path, even as a student. Uh, I'm a very monofocused person, and and um, that's the part that I enjoy. I enjoy like doing that for eight hours. I don't want to take in 20 other things at the same time. Um, this is from Evil Erica. Oh. <laughs> Not too evil, please. Uh, as someone who's grown up in the industry, what are the difficulties you've experienced in getting jobs? How has it differed through decades? I don't have a lot of experience about difficulty getting jobs, interestingly. I... Uh, I guess because my identity was not so much about how much I worked. Um, as a director, you know, the real frustration has been trying to get movies off the ground um, and trying to get them right. I've always been able to find funding for movies, but I haven't been able to get the scripts to the level that I feel like they're ready to go. So that is, that's a different song than you'll hear, hear from most people. Most people will say it's the hardest thing is getting the money. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really discerning, or I maybe don't trust my fabulous creative abilities enough to be able to navigate a bad screenplay. So I really have to get the screenplay right, and that has been the greatest challenge for me. Um, can we talk about Money Monster for a second? Sure. Because I loved that film. Oh. And I would go on, clap properly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Not a golf clap. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, and uh, do you know what I loved was the casting in that as well, and Jack in particular. Jack was great. Who is just incredible. And it's such an exciting talent as well in terms of his capabilities and stuff. Can you talk to me a little bit about, because I'm intrigued about your casting process uh -huh. in terms of 
how you cast and what it was about him in particular for that role? Um, yeah, I, I really saw every actor in the world, every, every actor in the world in America really wanted to play that part. Um, and people thought I was crazy for casting an English guy. Not just an English guy, but an English guy that has an accent that I can't even understand. It's so thick. Like, it's so thick. It's just... <laughs> um, but I think he really brought something amazing to it. I think that he brings a working class understanding of it that um, was difficult for a lot of actors. Um, and he really approaches movies purely emotionally. He doesn't, that's, he doesn't claim to have another way of coming at things, and that's his entire language. And um, I, I actually, I don't think I've ever met anybody that works as hard as that guy. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I actually even had an audition on Skype, which is not something I've really done before, audition on Skype, and, and then cast the person off an audition on Skype, but he was very committed. Um, my casting process is, um, I think you know it when you see it, and maybe because I've acted for so many years, uh, I have a pretty good shorthand with actors. Um, I know that there's no way that I'm going to be able to magically transform really an actor's performance if it's not working. I can't transform a, an actor's performance in the 20 minutes that I have on screen, so I have to make sure that ahead of time that I've really thought of what this actor brings and what they're what they're trying to say. So I. I meet with everybody personally. I do all the auditions. Uh, a lot of people don't these days, interestingly. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of like, send me a videotape, and then I'll say yes. Step on tape. Um, although Jennifer Lawrence in The Beaver put herself on tape, and I saw the tape and was like, oh, yeah, that girl. That's it. <laughs> um, yeah, and I guess because I'm an actor, for me, it's very quick for me to, it's, it's easy for me to make that decision, but then sometimes I'll agonize. Um, for example, on The Beaver, I, I'm, I can't tell you how many actresses I auditioned for Jennifer Lawrence's part in The Beaver. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Um, it was stupid because they were all wonderful, and I couldn't really put my finger on what wasn't working. And when Jennifer, I, I, she sent us a tape, and I saw this actress and thought, oh, wow, well, she's not at all the way the character is written, but that's who I want. So I rewrote the whole, we rewrote the whole thing for her um, to sort of tailor it to what, what she brought to the character that was so much more than we had been able to find in the writing. I imagine it might be slightly intimidating for young actors as well coming into a room and having to audition <laughs> in front of Jodie Foster. Oh, <laughs> well, I, don't know. I don't know. In the first five minutes at all, all that sort of goes away. I mean, you, you know, you, you're, it's a, it's such a, it's such a hard job, and I have such respect for them. Um, I still am completely in awe of actors. I don't know how they do it. Um, I really don't. I really don't know how they do it, and I'm really their biggest fan. I feel like that's, if there's one thing that Scorsese taught me when I was acting, is that that really is what the director is. He stands behind the camera, and he's inside the actors' faces, and he's experiencing what they experience, and that's how I feel when I, when I work with them. I feel like I'm, I'm saying those words, or I'm feeling those feelings, and... Uh, uh, I'm just so grateful for them that they that they deign to say yes because I I could not do that I always feel like wow I could never do that which is crazy yeah, yeah. you could I guess I could <laughs> I guess I could but not not the way they're doing it or something I guess I just love their I love the the inspiration that they bring to things. Mm. I just looked down at the next question and I thought it was from Harrison Ford, but it's Hannah Ford. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Um, wouldn't it be funny if it was Harrison Ford? Amazing. Who's just like, Dear Jody. <laughs> um, <laughs> the accused was heroin, and a recent article suggested we've moved backwards since then. Do you, feel, do you think the film is still relevant today? I think the film's still relevant today, but I would not say that we've moved backwards since then at all. Not at all. Um, I think we are moving forward, and um, I think we're at a very painful point. Uh, an interesting place in uh, in our consciousness, whether it's about violence or whether it's about um, you know race, or we have a, a, a portion of the population that is that is really has really become conscious and does understand empathy and does understand uh, our issues of our countries in the past and really does want to repair, and then we have a huge section of the population that is the opposite end of that spectrum, and they're existing in the same era. So there really are two, there are two very, very separate eras, and it's a very, it's painful. I think this, this transition time is painful, but it is a transition. And uh, in terms of uh, female identity and female uh, sexual identity, um, you know, we, we understand things now that my mother's generation didn't. I mean, 
you know, one of the reasons why I was so compelled to do The Accused was because I got so many messages from my mom, and I knew how important this story was for her, and I knew that she would never have a voice to tell her stories, and that she would always be carrying around the shame of that, and the, the, uh, the foundation that that self-loathing and uh, you know that the, the sexual politics of her era had 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 given to her, and that in some ways that I had the opportunity to be a part of just a small part of changing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and our where we are now has nothing to do. I mean, we have we are far beyond my mother's generation, but not far enough. Yeah, I mean, there are still questions of sexual politics, obviously still going on now, and quite a lot of them. But you seem to have come, you came through that very unscathed, and kind of. <laughs> To a point, yeah. uh, protected in a way, and but but I think from from what I've heard and read, mm-hmm. your mum was so much of a part of that in terms of, you know, her from from the way that she wanted you to be, things to be meaningful and authentic. Yeah. That were the things that she taught you, and and yes, and she was also she was all those things. Amazing lady, you know, incredibly well read, uh, had you know very deep experiences in her life. I mean, she raised four kids on her own. That's something. Um, but she was also messed up, and um, there were a lot of mixed messages that came out of her, you know, and that I'm sure that whole generation uh, couldn't escape from. So um, uh, I, I just finished a show uh, called Black Mirror uh, that, I, that I directed one of the episodes. I'm sure you guys know that, know that show. Uh, and the episode that I directed is about um, mother-daughter relationships. So it's a little bit of like an Ing- Ingmar Bergman movie, but tense, and there's technology and stuff in it. Um, And it is very much about that mixed message process. You know, our mothers want us to be better than us, better than they were. They want us to be stronger. They want to raise women that don't have fear. But then when they see these fearless women, they want to break their kneecaps because they don't want them to leave them. Um, It was a complicated relationship with my mom and uh, uh, beautiful in some ways and really a struggle in others. And um, I feel like I'm the better for it, but it was complicated. How much are you enjoying the working in, you know, you did some episodes of Orange is the New Black as yeah. well, and you've done... Yeah, and House um, Cards. It's done this um, Black Mirror as well and stuff, and TV is just vibrant at the minute in terms yeah. of the opportunities it gives storytellers. Right. Well, that's where narrative is now, is on cable and streaming. And um, the viewing habits have changed. The movie business has completely changed. We knew that was coming the last 10 years. It's been a big overhaul, and... Um, uh, we will see movies. We will continue to see movies in this way very differently. So uh, we will go to the theaters, and we tend to go to the theaters mostly for, for big, massive, kind of intravenous entertainment that we're willing to spend that money on and to be in the theater on. But for the most part, most people will be watching films on their home screens. And as sad as that is, you guys are here in a theater. So, you know, there's a part of us that's sad because that's change. And you know, so much of our lives were about like, oh, going to the movie theater and the community of going to a movie theater. But we do have to accept that, you know, things are going to be viewed in a different way now. And really, the really great storytelling is on the small screen. We've got time for this one last question, which is a wonderful question from Samantha Ramsey. Okay. She says, uh, which character was most challenging to bring to life? Why and what was your solution? Wow. Um... I think the biggest challenge I've ever had was Nell, um, and not maybe a movie a lot of people haven't seen. Um, I played uh, a woman who had been raised in the woods uh, with uh, having with only one parent who had had a stroke at some point in her life, so she had her own language, and she uh, was was thought of as a wild child. And I developed the screenplay as a producer uh, from a play that we'd seen. And I went through this whole process. We developed this language that was, you know, it was quite a big feat, developing language. It had its own syntax, its own thing. And I got to, you know, about to start rehearsals, and I'm like, uh, what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. So I thought, oh, I guess I should do what all those other actors do. Like, I should go to, I should go to a dance thing. Like, I should say, go to a dance thing and see how that is. And I went to a dance teacher, and I was like, ah, that's not it. And then I went to uh, acting. I'd never been to an acting class or an acting teacher. I went to an acting teacher and talked to him, and there was a whole big mumbo-jumbo thing. And 
there was a whole thing, and I was like, eh, I can't do that. And I read all these books. I went through all these books about wild children, but that's not who she was. And I mean, I, I really, I did everything. And then finally I realized that I just had to drink a little coffee and wait till they said action. And um, there was something really, at, at first I thought that was the part that was really stressful to me. Like, what am I going to do if I'm not prepared? And I realized that all the preparation that I had done creating the screenplays and producing it and, you know, being involved with casting and the directing casting and all that stuff, I knew everything that I needed to know and that I really just had to relax and just be. And um, that was an amazing revelation. Who knew? And um, it ended up being from something, going from something that was the most torturous you know, ex performance anxiety decision that I'd made to something that was one of the easiest performances that I'd given. And um, it just was a part of me that I never knew I possessed, I think. I am somebody who's very intellectual, and that's just in my DNA. There's, it's just the way I am. And I play, I've enjoyed playing characters that have many layers of control. They control themselves in many different ways, and you get to see little parts of them, the parts that they don't control, etc. But this was somebody who lived with their skin exposed, and um, I didn't think that I had what it took to get there. And um, I think it was probably the biggest revelation of my life that I did. Yeah. Um, we've almost run out of time. Sure. Thank you so much oh, for your time. Oh, pleasure. Um, people can see this still on the big screen, which is great that the BFI have given us the opportunity to see that there you are. Oh, Silence of the me, it's me with brown hair. <laughs> uh, Black Camilla, when are we going to get to see it? Do you know? Uh, December. December? Yeah. December. And then you've just finished filming a film as well. I did, as an actor, yes. It's called Hotel Artemis uh, with a brand new director named Drew Pierce, who's English, so that makes him better. <laughs> and uh, a wonderful. Scottish. Oh, that's true, he's Scottish. <laughs> Sorry. They, grew, they actually grew up together, so she knows him. That's true. <laughs> Um, I'm excited to see that too. Yes, thank you. And what is next after that? Do you do you know? Uh, I don't have any plans. Um, I really want to take my son on vacation, so I think that puts July and August out of the picture. And you know, if I make something before then, it will be, it will be surprising to me. Please do. Thank you. Please do. The wonderful Jodie Foster. Everyone. Thank you.